I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is tacked from being a centrist deal maker to a full on liberal, and he's intervened forcefully in some major MTA decisions. We'll ask the New York Times Albany bureau chief what the governor is up to. And the Times, in the midst of an extraordinary project to digitize millions of photos in our archives, will tell you how this will pay off for Times journalists and for readers. Later, I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. But we begin with politics. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi clearly outplayed President Trump in the battle over the shutdown and the State of the Union. But another shutdown countdown is underway, a February 15th deadline. This week, we saw the spectacle of all the president's intelligence chiefs contradicting Trump's views on North Korea, Iran, ISIS, and Russia. Trump, of course, returned fire on Twitter, calling the chiefs passive and naive. Let's get some perspective on it all from New York Times politics editor, Patrick Healy. Pat, welcome back and thank you for joining us. Great to be here. You were out on the road in past campaigns. Now you're here as politics editor. How do we cover politics these days? You used to cover theater. Right. Now you're covering <laughs> politics, which is like kabuki theater. Uh, how do we know what's real and what isn't? anymore. Yeah, I think it's really important, Sam, to be not just covering this as uh, what has traditionally been called a horse race, sort of who's up, who's down. We're actually writing a lot less, I think, about polls and personalities, um, sort of the little day-to-day -day spats that come on. What we're trying to do is go deeper and write more stories about uh, the policy divides in the Democratic Party. We've got a good story coming up on Medicare for All and private insurance, another one on the Green New Deal, um, you know, something cooking on sort of marginal tax rates and what Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have, have come in for. And what we're, what we're hearing from readers of The Times and others is that they want more serious, substantive journalism about politics and, and policy and the candidates and voters. And we're trying to think seriously, okay, how do we deliver that when you could just write four stories a day about President Trump's tweets, you know, or whatever latest clash is, is going on. And you know, so you're, I mean, you've, you've, you've been doing political journalism a long time. The challenge that we've always had is readers say that they want this sort of substantive, in-depth work, will they read to it? Will they respond to it? Will we have the kind of presidential election that people say that they want and not just go back to, you know, chasing the tiger? Exactly. I mean, people always say, where's the substance? But of course, they read the, uh, you know, the conflict stories. Right. But how do we, uh, you know, this is a question that concerns all of us and always had. But nowadays, as more and more people get breaking news from other sources, sure. including on nytimes.com. How do we turn these policy stories, these more analytical stories, in a way where people say we're not injecting opinion, we're not injecting bias, we're not leading in one way or another? Well, that's that's a good question. I mean, in 2015, you know, uh, the Times broke the story about Hillary Clinton's private emails. And the reality was, and I was part of the reporters who covered the aftermath of that. And, and I think, uh, you know, understandably at the time, this felt like a very dominant issue and a proxy issue for uh, Hillary Clinton's honesty and trustworthiness, her levels of transparency. At the time, there were questions, why would someone use, you know, private email? And the reality is, is that we were writing a lot of stories sort of around kind of one, you know, one sort of theme in that regard. And, you know, we were writing a lot of stories early on about Chris Christie and Jeb Bush. Uh, then when Trump came onto the scene, there were a lot of sort of entertaining outrage stories. but. And, you know, then we would sort of move on to the next candidate. And, and that all of that coverage I, under, I understood and I was very much, you know, part of it. You know, this time around what we're looking at is, you know, um, 
earlier this week we had you know a heckler at Howard Schultz's event he was all over the place we had Kamala Harris um, giving kind of a uh, almost offhand remark about uh, Medicare for all and private insurance you had Jeff Flake saying he was not gonna run you have all these sort of moments and what we're trying to do is to be really thoughtful about not just sort of jumping into the fire kind of over and over again and just throwing out tons of stories without sort of a d sort of deeper thoughtfulness and context and being able to explain to ourselves what is the intent of this story why are we spending so much time whether it was you know Hillary's email in the past or on uh, Kamala Harris and, and Medicare for all and sort of trying to ask those questions you know of ourself and not just be chasing um, the news cycle you know I sit at my desk at the Times with the television on and it's, sometimes there's CNN sometimes there's Fox sometimes there's MSNBC and if I was just trying to pair my news judgment with what I was seeing on television sort of all the time over and over again you know you sort of you run the risk uh, I think of, of writing a ton about just one or two candidates mm -hmm. and we're trying to be also a little bit broader than that. Does it look I mean in your eyes it seems like Nancy Pelosi uh, more than anyone won this dispute over a shutdown we don't know where the wall is or not or what we're going to call the wall next but we do have another one looming in two weeks. Any sense mm -hmm. as to where that's going to go? Right now, Nancy Pelosi is saying almost on a daily basis there will be no money in the final deal for a wall. And it looks like it may come down to semantics, whether President Trump is willing to move toward border security. A virtual wall. <laughs> a virtual wall, a smart wall, what these things really mean to sort of dress them up. But what we do know is that President Trump at this point wants to run for re-election and he spent a great deal of 2015, 2016 saying, I'm going to build a wall and Mexico's going to pay for it. So what's going to happen in all those rallies in 2019 and 2020 where there's going to be a refrain missing, that refrain he used to say before, and the audience will want to know what happened to the wall. President Trump knows that, that the base is going to hold him accountable on the wall. I don't know if they're ever going to split from him, but the reality is, is that um, he's, he's boxed himself in quite well, and, and Nancy Pelosi's keeping him, you know, been keeping him on the ropes. I do think the question, partly, Sam, for the Democrats is, in the short term, it looks like a series of Pelosi victories, but in the long term, are Democrats going to appear to be so either obstinate or uncompromising or insistent on what, what President Trump could frame as kind of an open borders philosophy that, you know, they could get some blowback in those suburban uh, districts that they won. Could be a Pyrrhic victory for the Democrats. Hard to know. Thanks to Patrick Healy, political editor of the New York Times. And coming up next, Governor Cuomo's leaning left and flexing his political muscle. We'll tell you what to expect from him this year. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has always been known as a pragmatic centrist, but he spelled out a progressive agenda in his State of the State address, legalizing pot, congestion pricing in the city, a strong environmental green New Deal, among other plans. He also stepped in to uh, reverse the MTA's plan to shut down the L train, as well as blocking, for the time being, a fare hike. Does he have national ambitions, or is he just pumped up about having a Democratic legislature. Let's ask New York Times Albany Bureau Chief Jesse McKinley. Jess, is the governor leading or is he following the fact that he's now got a Democratic Senate? Uh, as you point out, it used to be three men or three people in a room. Now maybe it's one and two. Yeah, it seems more and more that the uh, that there is a division there inside of that Democratic you know, leadership in Albany. So you do have the governor and you do have the legislative leaders who have made very, very clear that they're working in tandem. Uh, Andrea stewart cousin and Carl Hasty, they're doing events together, they're, they're, uh, they have a very close working relationship together, and they've made it very clear that they want to be ahead of the governor on, on, on issues. And I think that has chafed the governor a little bit. I don't think he likes being behind on anything. Uh, so even this week, you know, he staged events before they did. He kind of preempted them on a couple of occasions. Um, so I think there's a little bit of tension there. 
Uh, and in terms of you know credit, who's who who came up with these ideas? The assembly, which has always been the more left you know, kind of leaning uh, chamber in Albany, has been ahead on these issues for years. They've been passing bills for for. They've uh, been ahead, but they haven't gotten very far because of a Republican Senate. Absolutely, and of course, it's easier to pass a bill that you know isn't going to actually become law. Uh, but the assembly can absolutely say that, look, we were ahead on things like, uh, you know, raising taxes on the rich, things like legalizing marijuana, things like even single-payer health, which will probably not happen in New York, but nonetheless has passed the assembly in the past. Well, the old saying, be careful what you <clears throat> wish for, these are things the governor has sort of said for a long time he's wanted. Now he may get them. How does he feel about that? Well, I think particularly when it comes to things like campaign finance reform, uh, those are those are tricky issues for him because in some cases, the way that campaign finance works in New York has worked very well for Andrew Cuomo. He has raised millions of dollars, for instance, through this thing called the LLC loophole. So when those sorts of laws hit his desk, I think there's a little bit of trepidation about moving too fast. I think that his office would like the legislature to take a breath, uh, but the legislature doesn't seem to want to do that. They want to charge ahead with as many things as quickly as possible. So has he shifted politically, or is he sort of being nudged a little uh, toward the left? I, I think this is the $64,000 question. I think most people who look at his career over the long term would say, look, this is a centrist, this is a moderate, this is a guy who ru rules from the middle and has been quite successful in doing that. During his second term, however, it's undeniable that he did tack to the left. But was he pushed? Was he leading? That's that's uh, up for debate. But certainly, you know, he, he raised the minimum wage, he got paid family leave, you know, things like this that are kind of progressive wish list things. He signed off on and, and in some cases really been, you know, if, if, if not at the very front of it, at least at least approving of it. So. And sometimes people deserve credit for changing their minds, too. Absolutely. Uh, what about the fact that uh, he has said he is not running for president over his dead body? I mean, is there any indication that that could change? Uh, and do his current political positions suggest that one way or another? Well, I think if we learned anything from 2016, anything can happen. Yeah, and so. if we learned anything from Mario <laughs> Cuomo, too. Yeah, and I think that uh, I think there are no active plans right now for him to run for president, but I think he's very aware of the field. You know, I think he's aware that uh, in terms of kind of old school, centrist, moderate Democrats, that's a pretty short list right now. I mean, you're talking about Joe. Although it seems to be growing. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of people that kind of fit that that profile, it's Joe Biden is kind of the most traditional, and he and Biden have a very close relationship, so much so that there has been speculation that he would potentially be a vice presidential candidate with, with Biden at the top of that ticket. Uh, so I don't think he is like actively in, but I think he is aware that if an opening were to come up where he saw a lane, he's got a pretty decent, you know, record that he could, you know, convince people that he, he would be the right guy for the job. Uh, what about the MTA? He has stepped into it now. He has avoided it for eight years. Yeah. I mean, you could ask where he's been, but at least he's there now. Uh, is he taking responsibility? Is it his MTA? Uh, is he now responsible for the subways? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a weird sleight of hand that he's trying to pull. What, he, what he's trying to do simultaneously is say, the MTA is the MTA. I don't have any control of it. Of course, I name you know uh, almost a plurality of the number of the board members. I have influence over others, but it's not my responsibility. And then something like the L train comes along, and he hops right in front of the camera, right in and takes over this project and says, oh, I've got a better way. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be faster. It's not going to cause a closure. So he's trying to have it both ways. You know, he's trying to simultaneously say the MTA is not my responsibility, but I can do what I want with it. Um, the thing he wants, I think, more than anything, is to reorganize that organization and, in fact, probably give the governor, whether it be him or someone in the future, more power over that. Authority. Which he can do, right? If he persuades the legislature to do it. Well, he's doing a couple of things right now. You know, Joe Loda resigned last fall. He isn't. There has not been a successor named. He's Said, the governor said earlier this week that he was in no hurry to name a successor uh, until he got a major overhaul of the MTA. And the way that he views the MTA is of this as a organization that was basically set up for no one to take responsibility over. And now he's kind of going out and saying, okay, well, let's let's redo this and maybe I'll take it over. So. It was interesting. I mean, it was set up to insulate it from politics, and of course now it becomes non-accountable. Yeah. Uh, so is this another be careful what you wish for if it's set up uh, to make him in charge, he's going to be stuck with it. Well, absolutely. I mean, you break it, you own it, right? So if, if he goes and gets the MTA under the full authority of the executive branch of the government, 
in a couple of years from now, people are still having 45 minute delays waiting for the L train or waiting for the N train. That's a bad place for him to be. Thanks to Jesse McKinley, Albany Bureau Chief of the New York Times. And straight ahead, history meets technology. We'll tell you how the Times is using the power of the cloud to help reporters make use of millions of historic photographs. The New York Times has millions of photographs, some of them genuinely historic, sitting in file cabinets in an archive known as the morgue. Seemed like a wasted resource, so the Times teamed up with Google Cloud to digitize them. The project gives reporters and editors access to an incredible resource, allowing us to add more visual context to stories, and helps readers too. Here to tell us all about it, Veronica Chambers, editor of the archival storytelling team called Past Tense. What is Past Tense all about, Veronica? So when the Times started digitizing their, the morgue, the photos in the morgue, um, they had the great idea that they would bring together a group of editors, writers, photo editors, that as we surface pictures, we could put together packages and stories and start sharing them with the readers sooner rather than later. And we did this this past week in a special section on Jackie Robinson yes. for his 100th birthday. We did. We did this beautiful section, which came out today, and we did a double track. It's actually a huge picture. So um, it's, it was really exciting. This is pretty special for all of us. And a great way to tell stories both in the paper and online at nytimes.com. Yes. And how do you, you choose both the subject matter and the pictures to be able to do this? So for, in particular about Jackie? Yeah. Well, end of year 2018, we started looking ahead and Jackie Robinson's birthday being 131 came up pretty soon and we thought 100 his 100th birthday, why don't we try to do 100 photos, which was pretty ambitious. But, you know, him being in Brooklyn and kind of stepping into history right here in New York, we felt like it was something that the New York Times might have a great foundation to build something really ambitious on. And we certainly do. That is a great keepsake as, as well. We also this weekend have another one coming up on Overlooked the series in the Times about people we should have written obituaries about, but for one reason or another did not. And uh, I took a peek at that in advance, and it is really a handsome section as well. Yeah, we're really excited about it. It's a special Black History Month edition of Overlooked, and you wrote one, I did which indeed. people should look for, Elizabeth Jennings, um, but also people that would surprise you, like Sam, like Scott Joplin. I mean, mm. that was kind of like, wow, how did he not get one? But he didn't. So Elizabeth Jennings, Scott Joplin, a lot of great people. You're working with Jeff Roth in the morgue. Uh, this is a, a place that has 600,000 pounds worth of photographs. How do we know how much they weigh? Because when the New York Times moved into their, the new building, they realized that the floor underneath the new building wasn't sturdy enough to hold it. So it's six million paper items, which is a lot of weight. So um, so it's actually held kind of downstairs in two buildings over. And um, so we know. And how? what is the process of actually scanning them? Six million is a lot of pictures. Yeah, so we have our storytelling team, and then we have a really great group of scanners, and they are actually artists, archivists, and what they've been doing, there are six of them, and they scan 3,000 pictures a day. Oh my goodness. And um, what's really fun is that every day at the end of the day, they kind of tell us what they found, and um, they tell us, you know, they share a few of the pictures that they love, and we often get our story ideas for them. I discovered once that the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, is not, in fact, an old Chinese saying. It turns out to have been uh, coined by a Kodak advertising man, but pictures do say something different. What do they say to you that you can't tell in print? The Times has always been more of a print-heavy paper, but only in the past certain number of years we have realized the power of, uh, of visual impact uh, online, in video, and uh, in photos as well. 
I think that one of the interesting things that we have seen with the paper is that there are some photographs that you look at, and it doesn't matter what your age is, whether or not you knew the people in them, whether or not you can identify them. There's a kind of immediate emotional, maybe even intellectual truth about them. And I think what's so powerful to think we have six million of them is that um, we all get to kind of experience them together. And also the, the photographs from the morgue are the raw photographs. They're the ones that ran in the paper. We also have the flip side of them that explain what? What, are the, what do the those verso. show? So, so um, each photograph, as they were taken out of the morgue, they were either stamped with a date that showed the date they were published, or they were stamped with the date that they were just borrowed, like a library book was. And what was really amazing, for example, for Armistice Day, we, um, we were looking through the photos, we knew the Times would have photos, and actually it was Jeff Roth, he said, hey, look at some of these photos a little more closely. We found 10 photographs that had not been published in 100 years in our paper, at mm. least. So that was pretty powerful. You're holding it in your hand, and you see one stamp from 100 years ago. It was, that's amazing. and it gives you chills. <laughs> was there any one or any one subject that caught your attention more than others that you were surprised to find that, that evoked something you hadn't expected? Um, I think what's interesting to me is the way the photographs in the morgue aren't organized by date. They're not organized by photographer. They're organized by kind of the subjects that made sense to photo editors over 100 years. So, you know, you find things like street games, and it's literally decades and decades of New York kids playing games, and we have to read the back to go, what is that game? Some of the games aren't even played anymore. Mm -hmm. So things like that are pretty exciting and fun. I think, to me, the way that the Times captured everyday life, as well as, of course, the big figures like Jackie Robinson, is really where the beauty of the collection lies, because it tells us a lot about how we became who we are. What a great job you have. Thanks to Veronica Chambers, and I'll add my thoughts on CODA next. Years ago on this program, I asked Morton Sobel a trick question. If he had been guilty of espionage, would he ever admit it? I can't answer that, he replied. I later learned why. In a subsequent interview, he confessed to me that after decades of denial, he had indeed been a Soviet spy. The confession came with all sorts of caveats. He had been found guilty in 1951 of conspiracy, not actual spying. He stoically served 18 years of his 30-year prison sentence. Unlike Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the secrets he was accused of transmitting were unconnected to the atomic bomb. He claimed that they revealed technology for defensive weapons, not offensive ones. And anyway, the Soviet Union was an American ally at the time during World War II. Sobel, the last living defendant to the Rosenberg case, we learned died last month, nearly 66 years after the Rosenbergs were electrocuted at Sing Sing. We now know that Julius was guilty, certainly of the legal charge, conspiracy to commit espionage. Also, that the government is capable of framing a guilty man. We know that Ethel was complicit, but that her brother David Greenglass lied when he testified to the most incriminating evidence that led to her conviction. And we know that Morton Sobel, after decades of proclaiming his innocence, deluded the public, his own family, and his dwindling circle of supporters. Like the Rosenbergs, Sobel had been a true believer when a rose-colored view of the Soviet Union idealized communism. Now I know it was an illusion, Sobel said. I was taken in. So were his diehard defenders. To me, it didn't matter whether they were guilty or not, Howard Zinn, the left-wing history professor, told me at the time. The most important thing was they did not get a fair trial in the atmosphere of Cold War hysteria. Sobel himself suggested that truth had been worth sacrificing. I never thought of my conviction as simply a frame-up, but as part of our national policy 
at a particular period in history, he wrote in an unpublished draft of his memoir. Nor did I feel that my life had been wasted. The struggle is the thing. It is the development of the people in the course of the struggle that became most crucial during the heyday of McCarthyism. My case served as a vehicle for many progressive people to register their opposition to the establishment's policies. The excesses of McCarthyism were perpetuated by the Rosenberg case, of course, but also by the left's refusal to admit that some American communists were, in fact, Soviet spies. The Rosenberg case remains an enduring story about blind loyalty that stoked national paranoia, about the challenges of reconciling national security and civil liberties, and about singling out a particular group for public scorn or private suspicion. As long as I live, Morton Sobel wrote, I will do my best to see that this damning legacy of the Cold War remains alive. Sobel is now dead. In light of what we now know and where we are today, what have we learned from that legacy? For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.